So you're saying that there is a gap between the computer or the the um, the machine that performs computation and this machine that appears to have consciousness and intelligence. Yeah. That, Can we um that piece of meat in your head. Piece of meat. And maybe it's not just the meat in your head, it's the rest of you too. I mean, you have you have you actually have a neural system in your gut. Um I I tend to also believe not believe but we're now dancing around things we don't know, but I tend to believe other humans are important. Like, so we're almost like, I, I, I just don't think we would ever have achieved the level of intelligence we have with other humans. Uh, I'm not saying so confidently, but I have an intuition that some of the intelligence is in the interaction. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, you know, I think it, it's, Seems to me very likely. Again, we, you know, this is speculation, but we, our species, and probably, um, probably Neanderthals to some extent, because you can find uh, old bones where they seem to be counting on them by putting notches um, that were near that in near Neanderthals had done. We are able to put um, some of our stuff outside our body into the world, and then other people can share it. Mm -hmm. And then we get these tools that become shared tools. And so there's a whole coupling that would not occur in, you know, the single deep learning network, which was fed, you know, all of literature or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the neural network can't um, step outside of itself. But is there, is there some, um, can we explore this dark room uh, a little bit and try to get at something? What what is the magic? Where does the magic come from in the human brain that creates the mind? What, what, what's your sense it, as scientists that try to uh, understand it and try to build it? What are the directions that, um, if followed might be productive? Is it creative interactive robots? Is it creating large deep neural networks that uh, do like self supervised learning and just like will 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 discover that when you make something large enough, some interesting things will emerge. Is it through physics and chemistry and biology, like artificial life angle, like will sneak up in this uh, four quadrant matrix that you mentioned? Is there anything you, yeah. you're most, if you had to bet all your money, <laughs> financial advice. I wouldn't. <laughs> okay. So every intelligence we know, and includes, you know, animal intelligence, dog intelligence, you know, uh, uh, octopus intelligence, which is a very different sort of architecture from, from us. Um, all the intelligences we know um, perceive the world in some way um, and then have action in the world, but they're able to um, perceive objects in a way which is actually pretty damn Pheno phenomenal <laughs> and surprising. You know, we tend to think, you know, that uh, that that uh, the, the box over here between us, which is a sound box, I think, is is a blue box. But uh, blueness um, is something that we construct with with um, um, uh, color constancy. It's not a. It's not a. It's not the blueness is not a direct function of the photons we're receiving. It's actually context you know which is why um you can turn uh, you know you, you've maybe seen the examples where um someone turns a stop sign into a um some other sort of sign by just putting a couple of marks on them and the mm -hmm. deep learning system gets it wrong and everyone says but the stop sign's red it, you know why is yeah. it why is it think it's the other sort of sign because redness is not intrinsic in just the photons it's actually a construction of an understanding of the whole world and the relationship between objects to get con color constancy um but our uh, tendency in order that we get an archive paper really quickly is you just show a lot of data and gi give yeah. the labels and hope it figures it out but it's not figuring it out in the same way we do we have a very complex perceptual understanding of the world dogs have a very different perceptual understanding based on smell they go smell smell a post they can tell um how many you know different dogs have visited it in the last 10 hours and how long ago there's all sorts of stuff that we just don't perceive about the world and just taking a single snapshot is not perceiving about the world it's not perceiving the the registration between us and the object and registration is a a philosophical concept brian cantwell smith talks about it a lot very difficult 
squirmy thing to understand. But I think none of our systems do that. We've always talked in AI about the symbol grounding problem, how our symbols that we talk about are grounded in the world. Mm -hmm. And when deep learning came along and started labeling images, people said, ah, the grounding problem has been solved. No, the labeling problem was solved with some percentage accuracy, which is different from the grounding problem. So you are... Uh... There's uh you agree with Hans Marvek and uh, the, what's called the Marvek's paradox that uh, highlights this counterintuitive notion that reasoning is easy, but perception is, and mobility are hard. Yeah, we shared an office when um, we were, when I was working on computer vision and he was working on his his first mobile robot. What were those conversations like? They were great. <laughs> <laughs> so do you still kind of? Maybe you can elaborate. Do you still believe this kind of notion that perception is really uh, hard? And like, can you make sense of why we humans have this poor intuition about what's hard and not? Well, AI? well, well. Let me let me give a sort of a, a an, another another story. Sure. If you go back to you know the original um, you know teams working on AI. Um, from the late 50s into the 60s, you know, and you go to the AI lab at MIT. Um, who was it that was doing that? It was a bunch of really smart kids who got into MIT, mm -hmm. and they were intelligent. So what's intelligence about? Well, the stuff they were good at, playing chess, doing integrals. That was that was hard stuff. Yeah. But, you know, a baby could see stuff. That wasn't that wasn't intelligent. That was, any, anyone could do that. That's not intelligence. Yeah. And so it, you know, this there was this intuition that the hard stuff is the things they were good at, and the easy stuff was the stuff that everyone could do. Yeah. And maybe I'm overplaying it a little bit, but I think there's an element of that. Yeah, I mean, there. I don't know how much truth there is to uh, like chess, for example, as was for the longest time seen as the highest uh, level of intellect. Right. Until we got computers that were better at it than people. And then we realized, you know, if you go back to the 90s, you'll see, you know, the stories in the press around when, when um, Kasparov was beaten yeah. by Deep Blue. Oh, this is the end of all sorts of things. Computers are going to be able to do anything from now on. And we saw exactly the same stories with Alpha Zero, the, the Go playing program. Yeah. yeah. But still, to me, reasoning is a special thing. And perhaps no, we actually we're, we're really bad at reasoning. We just use these analogies based on our hunter gatherer intuitions. But why is that not? Don't you think the ability to construct metaphor is a really powerful thing? Oh yeah, it is. Stories, it is. That's yeah. the, it's the constructing the metaphor and registering that yes, something constant in our brains. Like yeah. isn't that what we're doing with with vision too? And we're we're telling our stories. We're constructing good models of the world. We're yeah, yeah, but uh, but um. I think we, we jumped between what we're capable of and how we're doing it right there. Yeah. There was a little confusion sure. that went on sure. um, <laughs> uh, as, as we were telling each other stories there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> trying to delude each other. No, I, I just think uh, I'm not exactly, so I'm trying to pull apart this Marvax paradox. I it's, don't view it as a paradox. <laughs> no, what, did evolution, what did evolution spend its time on? Yes. It spent its time on getting us to perceive and move in the world that was, you know, 600 million years as multi-cell creatures doing that. And then it was, you know, relatively recent that we, that we you know, were able to um, hunt or, or gather or, you know, even, even animals hunting. That's much more recent. And then, and then uh, anything that we, you know, speech, uh, language, those things are, you know, just a couple of hundred thousand years yeah. probably, if, 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 if that long. And then agriculture, 10,000 years, you know, all that stuff was built on top of those earlier things, which took a long time to develop. So if you then look at the engineering of these things, so building it into robots, what's the hardest part of robotics, do you think? As uh, through the decades that you worked on robots, uh, in the context of what we're talking about, vision, you know, perception, the actual sort of the, the biomechanics of movement, uh, I'm kind of drawing parallels here between humans and machines always. Like, uh, what do you think is the hardest part of robotics? I, I sort of think all of them. <laughs> um, there are no easy parts to do well. Um, 
we we sort of go reductionist and we reduce it to oh, if only we had all the the location of all the points in 3D yeah. things would be great <laughs> you yeah. know if only we had labels on the on the images you know things would be great but you know as as we see that's not good enough uh, some deeper understanding but if you if i came to you and i could solve one category of problems in robotics uh instantly what would give you uh the greatest pleasure <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, i mean is it uh, you know you you look at robots that manipulate objects uh wh what's hard about that you know is it uh the perception is it the um the reasoning about the world like common sense reasoning is it the actual building a robot that's able to interact with the world? Is it like human aspects of a robot that's interacting with humans and that, that game theory of how they work well together? Well, let's talk about manipulation for a second, because sure. I had this really blinding moment. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a grandfather, so grandfathers have blinding moments. Yes. Just a, a three or four miles from here, um, last year, my 16-month-old uh, grandson was in his new house, first time, right? First time in this house. And he'd never uh, been able to get to a window before, but this had some low windows. Mm -hmm. And he goes up to this window with a handle on it that he's never seen before. And he's got one hand pushing the window and the other hand turning the handle to open the window. Mm -hmm. he, he, he knew he, two different hands, two different things he knew how to, how to put together. Yeah. And he's 16 months old. And there you are watching in awe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, how did in he, an how environment did he, environment he'd never seen before, a mechanism he'd never seen. How did seen. he do that? How yes, do that? that's a good question. How did he do that? That's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, like you could see the, the, the leap of genius from using one hand to perform a task to combining to doing, I mean, first of all, in, in manipulation, that's really difficult. It's like two hands both necessary to complete the action and completely different and he'd never seen a window open yeah. before <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> but he inferred somehow handle open something yeah you know, there may have been a lot of um slightly different failure cases that you didn't see yeah not, not with a window but with other objects of t turning and twisting and handles oh well, the, the, you know there's a there's a great counter to um you know, reinforce, reinforcement learning will just give you know the the robot um, you give the robot plenty of time to try everything. Yes, actually, can I tell a little side story here? So I'm in um, DeepMind in London. Uh, this is three four years ago, where um, you know there's a big Google building, and then you go inside and you go through this more security, and then you get to DeepMind where the other Google employees can't go. Yeah, and I'm in a I'm in a conference room, a conference room with some of the people, and they tell me about their reinforcement learning experiment with uh, robots, um, um, which um, are just trying stuff out. And they're my robots. They're, they're Sawyers that we sold them. Um, uh, and they really like them because Sawyers are compliant and can sense forces, so they don't break when they're bashing into walls. They, mm -hmm. they stop and they do all this stuff. And you know, so you just let the robot do stuff, and eventually it figures stuff out. By the way, so we're, we're talking about robot manipulation, so robot arms and so on. Yeah, so so is a robot. Yeah, arm. just you know, what's Sawyer? So is a robot arm that my company Rethink Robotics yeah. built. Thank you for the context. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. So we're in deep mind. Uh, and the, the you know, it's in the next room. These robots are just bashing around to try and use reinforcement learning to learn how to act. And well, can I go see them? Oh no, they're secret. They were my robots that yeah. were secret. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the point is, you know, this idea that you just let uh, reinforcement learning figure everything out is so counter to how a kid does stuff. So, again, story about my grandson. I gave him this, this uh, uh, box that had lots of different lock mechanisms. He didn't randomly, you know, and he was 18 months old. He didn't randomly try to touch every surface or push everything. He found he could see what where the mechanism was and he started exploring the mechanism mm -hmm. for each of these different lock mechanisms he, and there was reinforcement no doubt of some sort going on there but he 
applied a pre-filter which cut down the search space dramatically. I, I, I wonder to what level we're able to introspect what's going on. Because what's also possible is you have something like reinforcement learning going on in the mind in the space of imagination. So like you have a good model of the world you're predicting and you may be running those tens of thousands of like loops, but you're like, as a human, you're just looking at yourself, trying to tell a story of what happened. And it might seem simple, but maybe there's a lot of computation going on. Whatever it is, but there's also a mechanism that's being built up. It's yeah. not just random search. That yeah. mechanism prunes it dramatically. Yeah, the that that pruning uh that pruning step. But it doesn't it's possible that that's so you don't think that's akin to a neural network inside a reinforcement learning algorithm. Is it possible? It's uh, yeah, until <laughs> it's possible. I uh but but I you know um I I I I'll be incredibly surprised if that happens. I'll also be incredibly surprised that, you know, after all the decades that I've been doing this, where every every few years someone thinks, now we've got it, mm -hmm. now we've got it. I, you know, I, four or five years ago, I was saying, I don't think we've got it yet. And everyone was saying, oh, you don't understand how powerful AI is. I had people tell me, you don't understand how powerful it is. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I sort of had a, a, a track record of what the world had done to think, well, this is no different from before. Yeah. Oh, we have bigger computers. We had bigger computers in the 90s and we could do more shit stuff. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so let me let me, let me push back. Because I'm, I'm generally sort of optimistic and try to find the beauty in things. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, surprising and beautiful things that neural networks, this new generation of deep learning revolution has revealed. To me, it has continually been very surprising the kind of things it's able to do. Now, oh. generalizing that over saying like this, we've solved intelligence, that's another uh, big leap. But is there something surprising and beautiful to you about neural networks that where actually you sat back and said, I, I did not expect this? Oh, I think, I think their performance, their performance on ImageNet was shocking. So computer vision, those early days, it was just very like, wow, okay. That doesn't mean that they're solving everything in computer vision we need to solve or in vision for robots. What about Alpha Zero and self-play mechanisms and reinforcement learning? Isn't that? Yeah, that was all in, in Donald Mickey's 1961 paper. Um, <laughs> everything there was there, which introduced reinforcement learning. Um, no, but come on. So, no, you're talking about the actual techniques but isn't it surprising to you the level it's able to achieve with no human supervision of chess play? Like, I, so to me, there's a big, big difference maybe, between maybe, Blue and- Maybe what that's saying is how overblown our view of ourselves is. You know, we- That chess is easy? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, I came across this, 1946 report mm -hmm. that, um, and I'd seen this as a kid in one of those books that my mother had given me, actually. Um, 1946 report, which pitted uh, uh, someone with an abacus against an electronic calculator, mm -hmm. and he beat the electronic calculator. You know, so there, at that point, was, well, humans are still better than you know, right. machines at calculating. Are you surprised today that a machine can, you know, do a billion floating point operations a second and, you know, you're you're puzzling for for minutes to do one? So, you know, I I am I mean, I, I don't know, but I am certainly surprised there's something uh to me different about learning. So, a system that's able to learn learning. Now, see, see now you're getting into one of the d deadly sins. Mm -hmm. Um because of using terms uh, overly broadly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so many different forms of learning. Yeah. And so many different forms. You know, I learned my way around the city. I learned to play chess. I learned Latin. Um, I learned to ride a bicycle. All of those are, you know, are very different capabilities. Yeah. And if someone, you know, has a, well, in you know, in the old days, people would write a paper about learning something. Now, the corporate uh, press office puts out a press release about how 
company X has has is leading the world because they have a system that can. Yeah, but here's the thing. Okay, so what is learning? When I refer to learning, is many things. But it's I, a suitcase I, word. In, it's a suitcase word, but let's loosely, there's a dumb system, and over time, it becomes smart. Well, it becomes less dumb at the thing that it's doing. Yeah, smart exactly. is a diff- yes, smart less, is a loaded right. word. Yes, less less dumb at the thing it's it, doing. It gets better performance under some measure. Yeah, under some set of conditions, at that thing, and and most of these learning algorithms, um, uh, learning systems, fail when you change the conditions just a little bit in a way that humans don't. So, right, I was at DeepMind. Um, the AlphaGo had just come out. Mm-hmm. And I said, what would have happened if you'd given it a 21 by 21 board instead of a 19 by 19 board? They said, fail totally. But a human player would actually, you know, well, would actually be able to play a and game. And actually, funny enough, if you look at DeepMind's work uh, since then, uh, they are pre- pre- uh, they're presenting a lot of algorithms that would do uh the, that would do well at the at the bigger board. So they're slowly expanding this generalization. I mean, to me, there's a core element there. I, it is very surprising to me that even in a constrained game of chess or Go, that through self-play by a system playing itself, that can it can achieve superhuman level performance through learning alone. So like- Okay, so, so you know, you, you it's didn't- It's so you, fundamentally you different in search of that. You, didn't, you didn't like it when I referred to Donald Mickey's 1961 paper. There, yes. in the second part of it, which yes. came a year later, they had self-play on an electronic computer yes. at tic-tac-toe, okay, yeah. it's not as, but it learned to play tic-tac-toe through self-play. No, no, that, that's not- And it what, learned to play optimally. What I'm saying is uh, I, Okay, I have a little bit of a bias, but I, I, I find ideas beautiful, but only when they actually realize the promise. That's another level of beauty. Like, for example, uh, what uh, uh, Bezos and Elon Musk are doing with rockets. We had rockets for a long time, but doing reusable cheap rockets, it's very impressive. In the same way, I, okay. Yeah. I would have not predicted, first of all, when I was uh, started and fell in love with AI, the game of Go was seen to be impossible to solve. Okay, so I thought maybe you know I maybe it'd be possible to maybe have big leaps in a Moore's law style of way in computation that would be able to solve it. But I would never have guessed that you could learn your way. However, I mean, in the narrow sense of learning, learn your way to 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 beat the best people in the world at the game of Go without human supervision, not studying the game of experts. My, okay, so so that's using, surprising. Using, using a different learning technique. Yes. Arthur Samuel in the early 60s, and he was the first person to use machine learning, yeah. got, had a program that could beat the world champion at checkers. Now, yes. so, and that at the time was considered amazing. Yeah. By the way, Arthur Samuel had some fantastic advantages. Do you want to hear Arthur Samuel's well, yeah, yeah, advantage? Please. Two things. One, he was at uh, the 1956 um, AI conference. I knew Arthur later in life. Uh, he mm-hmm. was at Stanford when I was a graduate student there. He wore a tie and a jacket every day. Nice. The rest of us didn't. Um, he's a delightful man, delightful man. Um, uh, it turns out Claude Shannon, in a 1950 Scientific American article, uh, outlined the uh, on chess playing, outlined the learning mechanism that Arthur Samuel used, um, and they had met in 1956. I assume there was some communication, but I don't know that for sure. But Arthur Samuel had been an, a vacuum tube engineer on um, getting reliability of vacuum tubes, and then had overseen um, the first transistorized computers at IBM. And in those days, before you shipped a computer, you ran it for a week to see to get early failures. So he had this whole farm of computers running random code mm-hmm. um, for hours and hours um, a week for each computer. He had a whole bunch of them. So he ran his chess learning program uh, with self-play mm-hmm. on on IBM's production line. He had more com- computation available to him than anyone else in the world. And then he was able to produce 
a chess playing program, I mean, a, a checkers playing program that could beat the world champion. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing. The, the question is, what I mean, surprised, I don't just mean it's nice to have that accomplishment, is there is a stepping towards something that feels uh, more intelligent than before. Yeah, but and the that's, question that's, is- That's in your view of the world. Okay, okay. well, let me then, let me, it doesn't mean I'm wrong. No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, if we keep taking steps like that, how far that takes us? Are we going to build a better recommender systems? Are we going to build slightly well, better robots? Okay, or so, will we solve intelligence? So, you know, I'm putting my bet on, um, we're still missing a, a whole lot. A lot. Um, and, and why would I say that? Well, in these games, they're all, um, you know, 100% information games. But again, but each of these systems is a very uh, short description of the current state, um, which is different from registering and perception in the world, okay. which gets back to Maravik's paradox. I'm definitely not saying that uh, uh, chess is somehow harder than uh, perception or uh, any kind of even even any kind of robotics in the physical world, I, I definitely think is is way harder than the game of chess. So I'm, I was always much more impressed by like the, the workings of the human mind. It's incredible. The human mind is incredible. I've, I I believe that from the very beginning. I wanted to be a psychiatrist for the longest time. I always thought that's way more incredible than the game of chess. I think the game of chess is a I love the Olympics. It's it's just another example of us humans picking a task and then agreeing that a million humans will dedicate their whole life to that task. And that's the cool thing that the human mind is able to focus on one task and then compete against each other and achieve like weirdly incredible levels of performance. That's the aspect of chess that's super cool. Not that chess in itself uh, is really difficult. It, so, it's, it's like the Fermat's last theorem is not in itself to me that interesting. The fact that uh, thousands of people have been struggling to solve that particular problem is, is fascinating. So can I tell you my disease in this way? Sure. Uh, which <laughs> actually is closer to what you're saying. Yeah. So as a child, you know, I was building various, I called them computers. They weren't general purpose computers. Ice cube tray. The ice cube tray was one, but I built other machines. And what I liked to build was machines that could beat adults at a game yeah. and they couldn't, the adults couldn't beat my machine. Yes. So, so that was. So you were like, uh, <laughs> that's powerful. Like that's a, that's a way to rebel. Yeah. I, I by the way, um, did you, when was the first time you built something that outperformed you? Do you remember? Like, well, it, it, I knew how it worked. I was probably nine years old and I built a thing that, it was a game where you, you take turns in taking matches from a pile and the, either the one who takes the last one or the one who doesn't take the last one wins, I forget. Yeah. And so it was pretty easy to build that out of wires and nails and little coils that were like plugging in the number and uh, a few light bulbs. Um, the one the one I was prouder of, I was 12 when I, I built a, a, a thing out of old um, telephone switchboard switches that could uh, always uh, win at tic-tac-toe and that was a much harder circuit to <laughs> design but yeah. again it was just it was no active components it was just three position switches empty x zero or uh, o, and um and nine of them and, and a light bulb on which which move it wanted next and then yeah. the human would go and move that see there's magic in that creation i, I it tend, was yeah yeah i tend to uh i tend to see magic in robots that like I, I also think that intelligence is uh, is a little bit overrated. I think we can have deep connections with robots very soon. And well, we'll come back to connections with robots. Sure, but but I do want to say, I I don't I I think people too many people make the mistake of seeing that magic and thinking, well, it will just continue, you know. But each each one of those is a hard fought battle. For the next step, the next step. Yes, I mean, the open question here is, and this is why I'm playing devil's advocate, but I often do when I read your blog post in my mind, because I have like this eternal optimism, is it's not clear to me, so I don't do what obviously the journalists do or like give into the hype, but it's not obvious to me how many steps away we are from, from a truly transformational understanding of what it means um, to build intelligent systems like, or how to build intelligent systems. 
I'm also aware of the whole history of artificial intelligence, which is where your deep grounding of this is, is there has been an optimism for decades. <laughs> and that optimism, just like reading old optimism is absurd because people were like, this is, they were saying things are trivial for decades since the sixties. They were saying everything is true. Computer vision is trivial, but I think my mind is working crisply enough to where, I, I mean, we can dig into if, if if you want. I'm I'm really surprised by the things DeepMind has done. I don't think they're so, they're yet um, close to solving intelligence, but I'm not sure it's not 10, to, uh, 10 years away. What I'm referring to is interesting to see when the engineering, um, it, it takes that idea to scale, 